Good evening, everybody. Are we ready to worship this night? Come on, let's stand to our feet. We're going to start off with a time of praise and worship. Father God, we just thank you so much, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy, Father God. We're going to be in here just worshiping you and praising you because you are so good and you deserve to be praised, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. generations falling down in worship sing the song of ages till end. all who've gone before us all who will believe will sing the song of the Greatest, your name stands above the name. All thrones and dominions, all power and positions, your name stands above the name. And the angels cry, Oh.
thank you for your holiness, Lord. We thank you for your holiness, Lord. Oh, we worship you in this room. Love me as you find me. 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 Love me as
is who you are. It's a grace I can never add to be somebody you still want. Somehow you love me as you find me. You love me as you find. God, we thank you for this night, and we thank you for this time of worship, God. We thank you for this time of prayer and just being in your presence, God. And so tonight, we just honor you with our, our praise and our worship, God. And we, we thank you for, for your faithfulness and your strength, God. And we thank you for all the times that you've stepped into people's lives, God. And we thank you for all the times that you've guided us and, and, and blessed us, God, and brought finances and brought blessing and you've brought healing, God. You've brought people home, God. And so we just want to take this time and we want to thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys. Well, go ahead and uh, turn to your neighbor. Go ahead and greet someone. Say hi. You know, shake a hand. High five. All right. Well, welcome, welcome this morning, um, this evening. Sorry. It's been one of those days, you know, <laughs> this morning, yeah. All right, everyone, let's go back to sleep, wake back up. No. Um, all right. Well, we are so glad you guys are here at our Wednesday services. They have been so good so far and have been so exciting to, to hear more about the words of Jesus because, honestly, those are the big ones. I mean, if you're to count words in the Bible, the words of Jesus kind of sit up there, number one. Um, yeah, I would say. You get the words of God, I guess, but anyway. So, a couple of announcements for you guys. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, we have just three things that you guys should know about. First off is our Christmas schedule. That is right. Um, we have things. Um... <laughs> You think I'll remember it. So this year, Christmas Eve is on a Sunday. So we're not going to have an evening Christmas Eve service. It will be at our usual 10 a.m. service time. It will be our Christmas Eve. We're going to do a candlelight service. So please, no one light the building on fire. It is new. We would like to keep it a little bit longer. <laughs> Just a little bit longer, you know, a couple years. Um, Oh, it would be a hard one to explain to the insurance people. Yeah, so listen, we just had lit a bunch of candles and hoped for the best. Yeah. <laughs> um, on top of that, so that's the big one. Obviously, New Year's Eve is also on a Sunday, and that will be just in the morning at the usual time because we are not the late night party kind of people, or at least, at least I'm not. I am asleep actually early on New Year's Eve every time for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, but going into the new year, January 7th, we are splitting into two services. So the first Sunday of the year, we will have a 9 a.m., and a 10.30 a.m. service. It is exciting. It will be really nice. Uh, give a lot of people time to split, come to an earlier service, come to a later service. If they serve in one, they can attend one. It'll actually be really nice. And last but certainly not least, the business and, oh my gosh, that's bright, entrepreneurship group has been moved from this next Monday, next Monday, this upcoming Monday, to a Tuesday. So it's literally just moved one day 
uh, which is the 12th at 7 p.m. So instead of being on that Monday, we'll be on that Tuesday for those of you who are interested. That is it. So with that being said, Pastor Steve, go ahead and come on up and give us some Jesus. Turn on my microphone, I meant. There we go. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. How many of you remember that I gave homework last time? Wow. Wow. I see a few people nodding. I feel, see other people looking from side to side. Okay. So the question is, so the Bible says in John 5, 24. Did you see that? John 5, 24. We're trying to get them to do a little better. John 5, 24, cough, cough. Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. So when we receive Christ, it's a life change. Am I right? Now, I know a lot. I mean, so I think my biggest problem with certain churches is they don't know the good news anymore. But there is a good news. Jesus came and he preached the good news. Okay. The good news is, though, that we can choose to receive Christ. Jesus said, to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be a child of God. Am I right? So just going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sleeping in a garage makes you a car. Am I right? <laughs> just said, no, seriously. Because, because many times you get the impression, well, all I have to do is be a good person, go to church, pray, or, and then I'm in. And that when we lived in, in Russia, for five rubles, you could get sprinkled. And they said, that was it. You're in heaven now. And so, so it's, it's more than that. And so the Bible says that when Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, we must be born again. born again. Born again. He was talking about a life and death change, life coming where there was just death. Because the, the, the Bible says that we're born spiritually dead. And that's why we sense like there's something missing in our life. Am I right? So I'm leading up to the homework last week. I wanted you to think about this. Many people believe that just praying a prayer will lead them to be born again. And many times it is a prayer. And yet I have prayed for tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people to receive Christ. They pray the same prayer, and yet some people, their life changes, and others, they don't. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. We, we see that too, right? It's not just me. Why? Why? That was the homework. Why? Why is that? Hmm. Connected. There we go. Pastor Steve Mayanja. Uh, so, yeah, there it is. There we go. So let me say it like this. So salvation is, salvation is kind of like a recipe, Okay. And if you're missing an ingredient, it won't work. How, how many of you have ever followed a recipe and you missed one ingredient or got one ingredient wrong and you had disastrous effects? I have. I remember one time we were, I came home and there was this beautiful chocolate cake waiting for me. And the whole family said, why don't you try it, Dad? What I didn't know, so my son who made it, um, so you're supposed to put a teaspoon, teaspoon of baking soda. He put a cup of baking soda. And although it looked like an amazing chocolate cake, I felt like I was eating toothpaste. You know what I'm saying? How many of you, used to, when you were poor, used to have the used to, uh, baking soda for toothpaste? Is that just my family? Okay, anyway. So, so, because the ingredient was wrong, I remember the first time I tried to make meringue. Meringue is you take the egg whites and you beat them, right? So you have to do it in a metal bowl. Because if you use a plastic bowl that has like, like surface contaminants, like any kind of oil... You can beat all day and it won't fluff up because you're missing an ingredient. I find many times it's not just the words. The Bible says we have to believe in our heart. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11 that when we come to God, we must believe that he is and that he rewards those that diligently seek him. And you can say the same prayer that's life-giving to someone, but without the faith inside you, nothing. Nothing. I'll tell you another thing that, that short circuits God moving in your life. See, when we receive Christ, there is an entrego. There is a, a, a giving over. There has to be a surrender. 
How many of you know the old hymn, I Surrender All? Yeah. But how many of you ever used to make, when you were kids, used to make promises, and then, of course, if you do this behind your back, you don't have to do it. Is that my right? I think sometimes when we receive Christ, we do that. We, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I'm receiving you, but, but I'm holding something back. The problem with holding something back is it short circuits God moving in your life. And so here we see this real phenomenon that you can pray a prayer, maybe even cry like a baby, and yet no life change because you're missing an ingredient. And so um, the reason I mention this is because we started last week, we're looking at the words of Jesus. We started with the big word, the R word. Does anybody remember which one it is? Repent. repent. Yes. And what does repent mean? Change your, change your thinking, thinking, metanoia, change your thoughts. Yes. And because when you change the way you think, I know this is the interactive preaching. Trust me, it works better. But when you change your thinking, it changes the rest of you. Am I right? As, as a man thinks, so is he, as, as it says in the, in the Bible. So after that, the very end of my message, we started word number two. I just feel like we're going really slow, right? Because on Wednesday nights, we're going deeper into the word. I hope you're hungry for God tonight. Hope you're hungry for a deep word. In fact, let's pray. Father, open my mouth that I may speak your word and nothing else. Open every ear to hear what your spirit is speaking to each one of us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know what I love about the Holy Spirit? You can have 100 people listening to the same message and come back with 100 different things because it's the Holy Spirit that takes life-giving words and breathes life to your own situation today. Am I right? Yep. Okay, so, so salvation's like a recipe, okay? So today we're looking at the second word that Jesus said because when he was walking along the lake, he'd see somebody, and what did he say? It's the F word. Follow me. Follow me. Yes. It starts with an F, guys. Where, where was your mind at tonight? Follow me. Follow me. There we go. Okay. Follow me. Yeah. And I want to look at that because sometimes we think we're following him, but we're not. So there's, there's two Fs here, that we're either a follower of Jesus or just a fan of Jesus. How many of you know there's a difference between a fan and a follower? A fan is an enthusiastic admirer. Um, I was a fan for the uh, Redskins until they played their first game, and then I switched. I just jumped off. I got, I was, I'm going to go for a winning team, am I right? So I was just a fan, okay? But we have people like Joe back there. She is a follower. That's right. She's a follower. There she is. There it is. Red socks and everything. She's got it. Okay. And that, you're not a Redskins fan. What, what are you? She's, there it is. There it is. Oh, the, con the conversations in the nighttime. Anyway, but anyway, so, but so I want to talk, but so a, a fan is an enthusiastic admirer. The question we want to ask ourselves, am I a fan of the Lord Jesus Christ or am I a follower? Let me tell you what a fan is. A fan of Jesus is a person who wants to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not close enough that it requires anything from them. See, we want a Savior that does everything for us without us having to do anything for him. That's a fan. Fans confuse admir admiration for devotion. They mistake their knowledge of Jesus, because everybody knows who Jesus was, for intimacy with Jesus. See, fans assume that good intentions make up for their lack of faith. So I want to look at today two characteristics of a follower of Jesus Christ. Characteristic number one, whew, there we go. No, no, no. Characteristic number one. There it is. There we go. We're, we're, we're working a new, new person back there. So, Anyway, to follow Jesus, you have to leave something behind. In fact, Jesus says that you have to leave everything behind. Matthew 4.20. And here's where, here's where we come. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Notice that next phrase. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Wow. What were they thinking? You can't fish without nets. They just left them. Apparently, following Jesus is deeper than just being part of the Jesus fan club. Matthew 4.22. Immediately, they left their boat and their father and followed him. Wow. 
their boat and their father. So they left their net, they left their boat, they left their father. Wow. Luke 5, 27 says it like this. After that, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi. How many of you know Levi's other name? Matthew. He wrote the book of Matthew. He was sitting in his tax booth, and Jesus said to him, follow me. Notice this. He left everything behind. Money and everything got up and began to follow him. Are we seeing a dramatic change, a difference? Matthew 19, 27. Notice what Peter said. Peter said to Jesus, behold, we have left everything and followed you. So if you're following Jesus, that means you, you left something behind. That's the difference between a follower and just a believer. So easy to believe. So easy to believe. It says in James 2, you believe in God, you think you do well. Well, the demons also believe and tremble. Jesus wants more than just believers. He wants followers. You can't follow Jesus if you've never left anything behind. If you can say no to Jesus about anything, you're not following him. Yeah. And uh, so, so that's what it means to be a follower. Could it be that some of us are here with, for just because for what he can do for us? I hear this all the time. Well, I'll follow Jesus, but not really big into the idea of going to church. And, and don't ask me to forgive the people who've hurt me. They don't deserve that. And don't ask me to say sex for marriage. I mean, I can't help my desires. Don't ask me to give even a nickel of my money. I worked hard for that cash. I really like Jesus, but I don't like serving the poor or helping out on Sundays. Hey, it's a miracle. I just made it today. How many of you know that person's not a follower of Jesus? <laughs> it's real interesting. Uh, a guy wrote a, a book, George Barner. He does research, ask about Christian questions. He wrote a book called Unchristian, talking about our culture today. And they, they, uh, they researched and they found that people from 18 years old to 42 year old in America, 65% of them say that they have made a personal commitment to Jesus that's important in their life. So the ones that said, oh yeah, I made a commitment to Jesus. So they asked them some more questions and they found out that of those that said they, they had made a commitment to Jesus, do I have that statistic? Go to that next one. Only 23% of them believe that sex outside of marriage was wrong. Here's another statistic. That only 13% said getting drunk was a sin. So here we have people that believe in Jesus but don't follow Jesus. There's more sins than just those two. How many of you know that? Am I right? I'm just, I just picked a couple of them because I thought that, yeah. So, so we, we really have a wrong understanding of how God's kingdom works. It's kind of like I read an article on the new vegetarians. They're vegetarians, but the, like, wait, let me say. Uh, here, uh, one young lady said it like this. I'm, I usually eat vegetarian, but I really like sausage. <laughs> and she represents a growing number of people who eat vegetarian but make exceptions, okay? They don't eat meat unless they really like it, unless it's a really good steak, right? So I, I'm wondering if we do this with Jesus. I love Jesus, but I moonlight as a pagan. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Am I right? I love Jesus when it's convenient. So I want to talk for a moment because he said, follow us. What does it mean to leave everything behind? Because here's what we do. Let me read the scripture in Luke. Uh, no, no, I don't want to leave. Not that one. Uh, can, could you skip way down to Luke 9? Luke 9, 23. Can you find it? And we'll go back up. But I want you to see this one. He said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Now we're looking at the words of Jesus. These are the words of Jesus. I want you to catch something here. Here's what we do to God. See, notice what it says. You want to be my disciple? You must deny themselves. Here's our interpretation. God, I'm going to find something I really don't like and I'm going to deny myself that. Am I right? God, I'm not going to eat broccoli the rest of my life for you, Jesus. Yeah, I'm just saying, you see what I'm saying? But we, you know, I'm not like that, but, but it's, it is like that. So important to understand what it means to give up everything. Jesus said, I like this in Luke 14. Let's go back way up to where we were before. 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate, and here, these are the hard sayings of Jesus. No, go to that Luke 14, the one that I started with. 1426, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his, his own father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, cannot be my disciple. Boy, that's a hard statement. We need understanding. But he, Jesus wasn't afraid to talk about hard things because that, often God will ask us a hard thing and he won't explain it just to see what's inside us. How many of God has ever asked you to do a hard thing but he gave no explanation. I love like what God did with Abraham. Abraham gets, wakes up one day and notice what? God tested Abraham. God said to him, Abraham, Abraham said, here I am. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Wow. He didn't explain it, did he? He just said, do this hard thing. Well, Jesus wouldn't do that to us, would he? Ask us to do a hard thing? John 6, 35, then Jesus declared, here's a, here's a, <laughs> I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He didn't explain it. Notice what happens later. Look, look what the response of the people were, verse 41. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. You know, when I say something that's hard, I try to explain it so much so that you won't get mad at me and leave. Am I right? Jesus didn't do that. He would just say something really tough and just say, suck on that a little bit. You know, think on that a little bit. Yeah. And so when he said something hard, you know what he followed it up with? Something harder. Verse 51. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. He didn't explain that either. Verse 52, then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? This is the point where I would be explaining my head off. <laughs> so you wouldn't leave. But what did Jesus do? Verse 53, Jesus said to them, very true. He went harder. It's very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Wow. Hard, harder, hardest. No explanation. Verse 66, here was what happened. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. I want you to see something here. Here. The good shepherd is saying a hard saying, and after saying it, many people stopped following him. Why would Jesus do it? See, the issue with these people is that they were fans of Jesus, but they weren't followers. See, they love the fact that he could make food appear out of nowhere, am I right? And feed them. Notice the context of this passage was uh, verse 14. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, same chapter, when he multiplied food and they all ate, and ate, and ate, and ate. It was like that buffet that just kept, kept appearing the food. They began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Then a few, a few verses later, notice what happens. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats. They went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. They weren't following Jesus to enter the kingdom of heaven. No, they were fans of his food stamp program. So Jesus told them a hard say. After that, this is when he said that. He told them a hard saying that their minds couldn't understand but if they were seeking God with all their hearts, their heart would have said, yes, that's right. I don't understand it, but that's what we got to do. Verse 67, after the crowds left him, the thousands turned away. He looked at his 12 and he said, you don't want to leave me too, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You know what was Peter was saying? Lord, I don't know what you're, I have no clue what you're talking about. 
Yet something inside me tells me that you're right. How many of you have ever heard a word from the Lord? You didn't understand it, but you knew it was, it was God. Yeah. It, it just doesn't make sense to the mind. Am I right? So many times God will say something that makes no sense right up here, and yet in your spirit you know it's, it's right. What's the difference? When I'm really born again and following Jesus, my spirit is open to what God's telling me. I just don't turn it away and turn it off. See, there's something about God that to find him, you must seek him with all your heart. See, that's what separates the fans from the followers. So let's, since we talked about eating his blood, why don't we just... Explain that one, since Jesus isn't teaching tonight, I am. I'm going to explain my head off. No. So notice what it said in verse 60. On hearing this, many disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept, accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. He wasn't speaking literally that they had to eat his literal flesh and drink his literal blood. What he was talking about was what we call the new birth, receiving Christ. He was telling them that to have eternal life, to enter the kingdom of heaven, we have to have him inside us. Not, not our body, but in our spirit. We must become one with Jesus. And that's, what the, that's the message of the New Testament, by the way. 1 Corinthians six seventeen says, Whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. When I receive Christ, so when... When I'm not born again, and we were all there, the BC person, we all know that person. Our spirits were dead, empty inside. There was a darkness. There was hopelessness. No peace. You know what I'm talking about because we used to be like that. But when we received Christ, what happened was his spirit became one with our spirit. And this is called the great exchange. Everything in him came into us because we don't have eternal life, but he does. With him inside us, now we have eternal life. We didn't have peace. Am I right? We had shame. But when he came in us, we have peace. Peace like a river. We talked about that on Sunday. Peace. 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 Mm. See, if you're seeking Jesus as a fan for what you can get from him, his words will never make sense to you. People tell me all the, all the time, I don't understand what he was saying. Yeah, you have to seek him with all your heart. There has to be a desperation in our life that if I don't have God in my life, if I don't have Jesus in my life, I'm not going to make it. Only when I tell God to take over everything in my life does eternal life begin working in me. And that's why many people pray but never receive Christ because they always have a condition. So let's go back to the hard saying of Jesus. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters... Even his own life, he can't be my disciple. What's Jesus telling us? Jesus is telling us that salvation doesn't work unless it is the first and greatest priority of our life. In Jewish understanding, hate and love were like a continuum. On one end we have hate, and the other one we have love. And what he's saying here, what Jesus is saying literally, you, not literally to hate your family, okay, guys? Just not, not saying that, not telling you to hate your wife, but he's saying that your love... For God, in comparison to your love for everything else, has to be so far apart that it has to be like the difference between love and hate. That's what it means to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. All your might. And I find that living a comfortable life makes it hard to do anything with all our might, with all our strength, with all our soul. It just is. It just is. It's just tough. That's the only way eternal life works in us. Receiving Christ is that great transfer. On our side, all we had was sin and emptiness, poverty, sickness, death, depression, loneliness, all the baggage we, we uh, carry in life. But you know what? The truth is we cannot receive what God's offering if we don't give up what's in us. Let me give you a great example. Do I, we have a picture right here? Of this, no, no, a picture. There's a picture. Did Joseph put the... Yeah. This is Kay, Kay and Medicu's garage, by the way. <laughs> no, 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 no. How many of you have a garage like that? <laughs> How many 
many of you can get your car in your garage? We want to applaud you. Get your car in your garage. How many of you can fit your, you can fit a car in your garage? <laughs> there we go. We're not talking about matchboxes, right? We're talking about real car. Okay, good. But here's what happens. This is our life before Jesus. There's no place for him to fit into your life. You got to just give it up. You know, you got to get rid of it. You got to empty it. <laughs> That's right. Amen. To follow Jesus, we must be willing to leave everything behind. Now we're back to Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Deny themselves. This is so important. You're not denying yourself something. You're saying no to you, to your aspirations, your dreams, your vision your, for your future. You deny yourself. You say no to Steve. Say no to Tyler. Say no to Todd. Deidre, you got to say no. <laughs> yeah. Does it, no, but am I right? Isn't that what we did? Notice what it says. We have to deny ourselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. You know what Jesus says? You have the right to hold on to everything you are, but I can't fill you like that. I can't fill you like that because you're already full. The only way God can fill you is if you surrender and give up everything. Yeah. That's why it says in Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven see poor in spirit that's a person who says god without you i'm not going to make it today amen i, I want to I, I don't know if i've shared this in a long time but so when i when i was a so i went to bible college long ago graduated in 83 82 83 it was 83 1983 and uh then I went and got my master's degree because I knew it wasn't ready for the mission field. So when I went to the mission field, I was, co I was convinced that I was going to win the whole nation. That time in Guatemala, 1985, it was 8 million people. Of course, uh, when I got there, I realized that I was missing one key ingredient. I couldn't speak any Spanish. <laughs> and uh, no one there spoke English, so I was in trouble. But so, so I had all these huge dreams, all the greatness that I was going to do. I'm surprised I, my head could fit through doors, you know. But when I got there, I found myself in a war zone. We drove, the, the AAA, used, they used to give these called trip ticks. They, you know, so we drove through Mexico. I lost my muffler in Mexico. They, they had holes in the road bigger than my car. Lost my muffler <laughs> driving through Central America, praying the whole way. Uh, get to Guatemala. Every bridge was blown up that we went to. We had to ford rivers to get, get into the capital. And now I'm terrified. And I don't speak their language. I don't know their culture. And I found myself not being the great evangelist and winning all of Guatemala. I found myself coming to the... I, came, I worked in an orphanage where no one spoke English. And they put me in charge of 18 teenagers that hated me. And within a few weeks, I hated them. I wanted to kill them. <laughs> I really did. But here's what happened. So I, and I worked there. I worked six days a week, I work, and I wasn't paid. It was, it was free. I woke up at 4.30 in the morning, 4.30. I worked till 6, 6.30 at night. I had one day off a week. And if they said, oh, hey, we're, we're shorthanded, that means you lost your one day off. And I'll tell you, within two, three months, I came to the point where I said to God, I just want to die. This the work is hard. The kids hate me. I hate them. We ate beans three times a day. And I'm telling you, I could barely breathe at night, just leave, leaving it like that. I wanted to kill them. They wanted to kill me. And what I realized, though, that God was leading me to something I missed in Bible college. You see, somehow through my Bible college days, I held on to Steve. I came to a point where either I was going to kill myself or I just had to give up. And he brought me to a point of death, and that's where I died. And you know what's interesting? When I gave up and I said, okay, God, I have no aspirations for the future. I don't care what happens. I don't care that I work day and night. I don't care that I'm tired all the time. I don't care that I'm, I hate these kids. I'm giving it all up. I woke up a different person. My ch situation didn't change, but inside I was dead. See, you know, uh, I, I have a couple dogs. How many of you guys got dogs? Dogs, dogs, dogs. 
My dogs love meat. Do you, anybody here have vegetarian dogs? Mine aren't. They love meat. Uh, <clears throat> your, yours eat meat, son? <laughs> Good for you, Brandon. They eat meat. Yeah, they're the, the new kind of vegetarian dogs, yeah. So, but I want you to catch this. So, so, like, I remember one time I had this beautiful steak, and I had to go. I had a phone call, and uh, I go back to the table to eat my steak, and it was gone. See, my dogs are big table height. They, they saw it, and they thought it was theirs. So you can wave a steak before a dog, and they'll, they'll chomp at it every time, right? But if you shoot the dog, you can wave that steak before him all day, and he's not going to move. Am I right? I have been tempted. But, but what I'm saying is that's, that's the problem with us. Why we have problems with sin? Because we're not dead yet. Why we complain about our life? Because we're not dead yet. Go back to that Luke 9. I want you to see something here. Very important. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily. Do you know when you have a cross, you're going to a point of death. Nothing else matters. Your, your life doesn't matter anymore. I mean, you're going to a point of death. Am I right? I remember uh, when I was in Bible in, in college, when I was getting my master's degree, there was a guy, our neighbor next door, never saw him and his wife ever. He gets cancer, has about one month left of life. How many of you know if you only have one month to live, you're, you live a little differently? I watched him walk outside holding his wife's hand, walking, just walking down the street. Never saw him do that ever before. But when, his, when he was going to a point of death, his, all his priorities changed. All his priorities changed. And so here I am in El Refugio, the, the, the children's home that I was at. And I had died to myself. Oh, my goodness. I've, and, and it worked for about a week, for about a week. And then one day I woke up at 4.30, and guess what? I was alive again. I hated them again. And I realized that there was one word I was missing. Daily. Daily. I had, I had to die daily. And that's the real issue of Christianity. We have too many people. The Bible says in Romans 12 that we must offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. See, the problem with living sacrifices is they tend to get off the table. They get up, tend to jump off the altar and live. Every issue I have in my life is always around the issue. Not, not money. It's not this. It's not that. It's not time. It's not that. It is that I'm not dead and that I still want to live. So every morning I say, Lord, I'm dying to myself that I might live to you. Galatians 3. 30. I've been crucified with Christ. The great Apostle Paul said that. I, 220, excuse me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Whew. That's our issue. That's our issue. And so if you want to be a follower of Christ today, it's so simple. All you have to do is die. Daily. Daily. <laughs> Amen. You know, there's two tragedies in life. One of them is we overcommit to things that don't mean anything. The other one is we never commit to anything of significance. All the things we fight for, all the things we strive for. Let me give you a second characteristic. If you follow Jesus, he might lead you to a place you don't want to go. But you know why it doesn't matter? Because you're dead. Because you're dead. Do you know the two words that never go together? No, Lord. No, Lord. Oh, no, Lord. No, no. See, if he's Lord, it's always yes, Lord. See, it's a, it's a consecration issue. All my issues in life go back to this. Am I really crucified with Christ or am I still trying to live? That's the, that's the issue. Lord, I'll follow you to Hawaii. <laughs> Don't tell me to go to Africa. <laughs> Amen. You know, someday we really need to plant a church in Hawaii. I was just thinking about that, but no. No, but... <clears throat> You know, it's interesting. My wife, uh, 
I don't know if God does that to you, but you know, you have a list of things that in your heart you tell God, don't ever ask me to do. She had three things when she met me, three things that she would never do. The first one was to marry an American. The second was to leave Guatemala. And the third one was to be a pastor's wife. And those happened to be the three things that she, does, <laughs> she has done. She was the only Guatemalan that lived in the Soviet Union, by the way. <laughs> yeah. uh, Matthew 4.19, Jesus said, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. You know why God wants you to follow him? He has a great plan for you. He has a greater plan for you than you could ever have thought up yourself. Your life will be, more, will be better and more blessed than anything you could have come up with on your own. That's why it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, God says to his people, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. The path of greatest blessing will always be the one that God has for you. I mean, guys, when we think about the path of greater blessing, it's lying beside a pool and having a lady, one of your wife, ch throwing grapes into your mouth. Am I right? That fan? Right? Women don't have that same vision, but, but men often have that vision. But <laughs> that may not be the path of greater blessing. Tyler and I know what we're talking about. Okay, I'm just saying. But First, first Peter 2.21 says, But you've been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. I, I was, we, we were talking about staff today. We're reading this book, and there was a quote in this book, and it said this, What we have done for ourselves alone dies with us. What we have done for others and the world remains and is immortal. Why, that, you, why we plant so many churches? How many of you saw the churches we planted on Sunday? We went over all of them. Boom, 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 boom. And they've all planted more churches because what we do what we give and we do for the Lord remains and is immortal. When I was in Bible college, God showed me a vision. I'm going to end with this thought, and then we're going to pray for one another. When I was in Bible college, uh, you know, we, of course, I'm praying all the time. God, what am I supposed to do with my life? Where am I going? What am I doing? So we, literally me and my roommates, we'd go to the chapel. We'd pray every night there. And one time I was praying, and I saw a vision. And I saw, I saw two roads before me. I saw this mountain. And I saw this like little goat path going like this all the way up this hill. And then I saw this beautiful broad road right next to it. And the Lord told me to choose which path I wanted to go on. And uh, I, I said, well, wow, that, that, that the road looks really easy. But I said, God, which one do you want me to go on? He said, I want you to go up down that mountain path. It's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard. But that's the path of the greatest blessing. So I left my country, turned my back on my culture. I left without anything. I left my language, left my family. I've been through fire and flood, been kicked out of countries. But I've seen thousands upon thousands of people come to Christ, seen miracles, seen the dead raised. It's just amazing what we've seen all over the world because God always gives you a better life than you could ever have imagined. And each one of you is different, but he's got something better than you could, could ever have thought. So this is what Jesus is speaking to us today. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. Wow. And notice what Jesus said, Matthew 19, 29. It's two scriptures down. There we go. Nope. Matthew 19, 29, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and inherit eternal life. Father God, I ask that your spirit would fall on your people. God, I know what our issue is because I fight with it daily because I want to live when you're telling me I need to die. Spirit of God, fall on your people convict us of the areas that we're trying to keep alive spirit of god and move in our lives show us your great and mighty plans oh god in jesus name amen we've got four minutes i want you to grab someone you don't know and you didn't come with and let's pray for one another today okay pray for one another if you don't like praying out loud you can pray for someone silently yeah
Okay, so it's going to be a tough one. Uh, if you don't know someone, if someone's not moving.
Miles to win the race of life, but what's the value without you? I could write a thousand songs to captivate your heart, but more than others, 
Once a pride. 